so because i have uh, re retired from active service in may and uh, after that uh, mostly uh, in a static inertia so so that way the curse will be also a boon for you. <laughs> yeah. so you can do whatever you want <laughs> so second thing is uh, i have a slight disadvantage in this uh, two disadvantages in fact one is uh, uh, coming after two intense and uh, very good lectures which have uh, they have a, uh, dr chandrashekhar and raj singh has covered uh, most of the you know, they have given a good overview and uh, i don't know what else i can add to that so i will pick up some things some um, uh, random things from their uh, presentation and uh, i will give my perspective on that that is what i will try to do i hope uh, it will do justice second thing is second disadvantage is it's an afternoon session so most of the people will be going i hope i uh, i won't put many people to sleep so but <laughs> that uh, i don't know about that anyway let us get into that so discussion so i'll try to so now i can uh, present my slides han ji han ji sir yeah just one second if it, it in between some issues come please let me know so it's okay no, it's visible is visible the slides not for now sir han ji said this visible yeah it's about uh, see the uh, workshop title uh, it's about microelectronics beyond 2020 and uh, here my focus will be on the uh, we will come to this uh, second subheading quality matters not quantity a little later we will come, uh, we'll try to justify it towards the end of my discussion so actually uh, i wanted to frame it in a different way uh microelectronics one of the challenges we were facing was the problem of plenty uh this was a uh, newspaper cutting many years before it came you know what is it just uh, uh, uh just before independence we faced this issue of famine bengal famine was a uh, big issue uh, and then we brought in the green revolution and the buffer stock of our grains uh, is around uh, 751 and uh, what is happening now is mostly this buffer stock is eaten by the rats actually so it's a problem of plenty so later on we'll see how it is relevant for us uh, it's totally disconnected uh, two things i am discussing so like microelectronics and problem of plenty and uh, this what are these issues will be a uh, little later we will come to that if i don't do justice somebody can raise it towards the end of my presentation definitely so, sir yeah because i with some scattered thoughts so i don't know where it is like a, it should not become a panchatantra where one story starts and another story and in end we don't know where the it begins it where it started and all those things so anyway so if if you see the uh, evolution in computation because uh, as uh, dr chandrashekhar has emphasized microprocessors or the computation is the uh, like actually the uh, technology is concerned especially the it revolution is brought about by the computation actually so today we have a computational device in almost everything uh, you are using it started with uh, some abacus abacus then you had uh, so all those evolutions today you have uh, 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 tablets or whatever so you had uh, computers based on vacuum tubes and all sort of mechanical computers were there so all those things were happening uh, as well as the computation is concerned so today actually we have in a position to replace us that means uh, see basically humans are known for intelligence so now we are capable of giving intelligence to our uh, uh, tools what well, that what are the tools means whatever things we have developed uh, for our convenience so we are uh, capable of giving intelligence and uh, basically the intelligence is given by the microprocessors or microcontrollers 
where the computation is done. So you have, uh, so we, uh, we talk of IOTs or internet of things or internet of everything. So you can give uh, intelligence, computational intelligence to anything which you use, whether it is a, earlier it was only computers, but today we have, we can give intelligence to almost everything which we use. So we can have, and then with a pro proper communication protocol, we can communicate to them. So we talk of internet of everything. And then this, once we give intelligence to these things, we don't need humans to control or use those things. So, so we can replace, we, have, we are seeing there are driverless cars, then engineers are being largely replaced, then doctors are going to be replaced uh, with uh, these uh, machines. And so you will be increasingly a threat of uh, useless class is emerging. Actually, this useless class is not So, sir, your voice is not audible now. Prasad, sir. Should disconnect over, no, sir? Ha, seems to be, ma'am. Sir, ne pehli share kiya tha ki it can happen. Uh, electricity issue is running at his end. He's from Kerala, no, hometown. Oh, okay. So there is some electrical uh, issue. Maybe he'll join in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, till the time we can handle query from the participants, uh, were you people able to download the software? Any issues regarding downloading of software? No, ma'am, it was downloaded. Downloaded. Uh, who answered? I'm Kunal. Uh, very similar voice, Kunal. I was talking about the class. Mein baat kar rahe. Yeah. 50IC, Kunal, na? 50C. 50C, yes, ma'am. Anji, sir. Done, done, done. So, so, so. Take it. Anji, Anji. Hello. Yeah. Anji, sir. Hello. Hello. I'm. I'm back. Hanji, Hanji, sir, now. we can hear you. Hanji. Yeah. So I'm sorry, the Murphy has caught me. <laughs> the, right at the, <laughs> the moment I started Murphy. Anyway, I have an alternative. So it Hopefully happened because you were running. planning to give me a curse and see what happened. <laughs> I should be careful. <laughs> anyway. Yeah.
The slide is visible now, sir. So we were talking about the elephant in the room. So elephant in the what is the elephant in the room? It is the tiniest assassin. It is about the I'm talking. Not, we are all aware, and we are all in the midst of a pandemic. That is the COVID-19, or popularly known as the coronavirus. So, you know, the issue with the uh, COVID is uh, every more this infectious disease vector and most of the time the vector we are the vectors we are disease vectors we are familiar are mosquitoes and uh, house flies and things like that or uh, rats etc fortunately or fortunately there are uh, big reasons for i am using fortunately and unfortunately uh, this uh, it is uh, humans are the vectors so you are uh, you have heard of spreaders super spreaders and things like that so what is the role of uh, electronics engineers in the covid management that also i thought uh, we should uh, think about that also so there are two things uh, uh, which are uh, which is happening uh, or which are in the management of uh, covid 19 we are helping in containing the pandemic and then we are all, uh, allowing the people to live with the pandemic that is uh, in defining of course we are living in a new normal so we are defining the new normal or living with the pandemic we are enabling the people so that we should we, sh we should feel happy about that so for example in the first part in the containing the pand i'm not going to the details that is not my area of but still we should be aware we should feel happy that we are able to contribute so tracking of the vector because it's a human the humans are the vectors for this disease so controlling the human so technology to control the human mosquitoes and house flies it is very easy you spray uh, you spray and kill them but that is not possible with these vectors so we have to use artificial intelligence and it revolution is becoming handy in tracking the people infected people and isolating them the chinese success story is uh, partially because of the uh, use of technology in isolating and tracking people tracking uh, people so in, uh, in many of the democracies fail because of uh, authoritarian uh, governments can impose such condition but the uh, democratic countries it is difficult to impose so that is why the failure but otherwise uh, technology is available to do that and then of course uh, defining the new normal we we have seen this is uh, your workshop itself is an outcome of that uh, you can work from home then that, uh, your uh, uh, classes are going on online then webinars then uh, entertainment and uh, uh, business everything more or less uh, we have defined a new normal and uh, it is life as usual more or less there are Uh, things, but uh, mostly we are able to uh, go with, around with our day-to-day -day activities. So that is uh, made possible by uh, this uh, IT revolution. And then uh, you have seen a variety of uh, uh, papers and conferences. Have a lot of publications. If you just glance through the IEEE Explorer, you will see a lot of papers coming around uh, in this. area finding out uh, various uh, ways of containing and then studying um, i mean all, all sort of aspects are coming so this is our contribution to contain and living defining the new normal under this uh, covid time so anyway so that was a separate thing uh, so we need to look beyond covid 19 and we know that we shall overcome this pandemic also and that has been the human story so far so we will be overcoming that the only thing is we can incorporate incorporate our uh, this experience for uh, in the future planning in all walks of life so that anyway that uh, lesson will be learned so this is one additional thing i wanted to mention yeah because we cannot ignore the elephant in the room so that's why i thought i should mention that and we are uh, 
we are also enablers of in in this under this pandemic also now let us look into the see the task of electronics engineers so electronics engineers basically are expected to develop electronic systems so we talk of electronic uh, gadgets so i need not talk about the uh, kind of gadgets uh, we are all familiar so i would like to bring your uh, uh, attention to the definition of engineering or especially the electronics engineering by professor anand agarwal of mit that link is given probably you can go back and check that uh, the definition of engineering electronics engineering uh, given by the professor anand agarwal of mit so we know that uh, uh, gadgets means uh, various functionalities are available in that gadgets for example if you take a cell phone you can have voice call you can have a video call we have uh, various other uh, music playing and all sort of, of different function even browsing and uh, increasingly the functionalities are going up and we know that uh, the basic functionalities are obtained by the circuit and uh, what is a circuit circuit is a combination of uh, some devices in a, uh, and which gives you a functionality it's like a sentence is a group of words which make some sense so a combination of words will make a sentence and similarly combination of devices um, gives a circuit and circuits have uh, give you functionality and then uh, a system will have multi function that means multiple circuits will be available so this uh, brings us to devices basically the basic building block is the device and uh, devices uh, over the years they have evolved and that brought in the revolution so this was our so basic building block of this our it revolution is electronic devices uh, we started with the vacuum tubes then we had uh, transistors were popularly known as bipolar junction transistors you can see that uh, this was the first uh, uh, bipolar junction transistors developed then we have uh, gone into a uh, different kind of device that is uh, mosfet and things like that and then what happened these then of course uh, using these devices a combination of devices we have made uh, uh, different circuits and defined, using different circuits we have developed the various electronic gadgets or electronic uh, electronic systems as an electronics engineer will call it as a system or no layman will call it as a gadget so the important thing has happened was 1958 earlier you had uh, various devices connected by an external wire or a pcb and things like that that uh, changed something around 1958 uh, and uh, the real radical thing happened in 1959 I, at uh, fair chance uh, develop silicon based integrated circuits that means the active and passive and interconnections are in, in, integrated into a single block of a semiconducting material that was the idea that was a path breaking idea and uh, jack kelby got a uh, nobel prize much later for that uh, innovative idea so that was the starting point of the microelectronics then uh, or uh, to uh, this again uh, was uh, uh, discussed in detail by the earlier speakers but i just uh, mentioned here there are two legs on which the whole microelectronics stand one is the prediction in 1965 by uh, gordon moore of uh, intel he founded the he and uh, robert noise founded the intel company who were the main chip manufacturers till two three years back so this is a this is a prediction based on the observations not it is an not a real based on any experiment it was an observation basically so that was the more slow the doubling of uh, components in the chip 
every 18 or two, two years or something like that. So that anyway, we had a detailed discussion in the morning about that and all of you are familiar with that. That is the first leg. So you can see that uh, all of you are again familiar with the evolution of uh, Intel processors over the time. So again, Dr. Chandrasekhar has discussed in detail about the processors. So I need not go, but processor can be so the evolution of processes can be used for demonstrating the evolution or progress in microelectronics or for showing the uh, Moore's laws progress. And uh, again, if you look into the, uh, the memory, we have the two important components of any computation is one is the microprocessor and the other one is the memory. So memory, the packing densities are typically higher than the processors. So the switching times are like, uh, uh, like it is not uh, mostly it is on the on or off state, whereas a uh, lot of switching happens in processors. So their, uh, their packing density of a processor is less as compared to a memory. So memories will have a higher packing density as compared to processors. So, but these two basically defines the IT revolution and over the years, we have seen that the processing capacity was increasing, the memory capacity was increasing, and uh, things like that. Yeah, then second leg on which uh, micro, the whole uh, microelectronics uh, progress was uh, Denard Skilly. So some, again, a scientist working at IBM, he, in 1974, the article appeared in Journal of solid state electronics. So there uh, he has given a way to see uh, uh, We have to understand the difference. Moore's law gave us a, a direction that uh, uh, it is possible, but he never said how it is possible. Whereas Denard gave us a practical way of implementing and obtaining the Moore's law by scaling the device's dimensions. And uh, again, a detailed discussion was we had in the morning. So I will not go into the Denard scaling. So we have seen that uh, almost uh, six decades, of course, uh, Denard's uh, scaling was uh, something around 2003 or so. Denard scaling principles were not, uh, it was not sustainable, but uh, Moore's law continued to evolve and it was still on track. So we have, uh, very like uh, earlier, we had all this uh, naming SSI, small scale integration, medium scale, large scale, uh, uh, then VLSI, ULSI. Then we stopped naming them. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is earlier when we talk of SSI to VLSI and all the chip size was fixed. And so we talk, we could talk in terms of uh, the packing density per chip actually. So that was one. Then uh, la uh, later on, we have stopped defining the chip size depend because SOCs came into picture, system on chips came into picture. So we did not standardize the chip size. So chip size started increasing. So there was no point in talking in terms of uh, packing density per chip. So we started talking in terms of feature size of the devices or the technology nodes and the feature size so we talk today. We use that term feature size. So you have uh, seven nanometer, five nanometer. Morning, uh, we have seen that three nanometers is the future, and the things like that. So technology nodes came, and the feature size was the term used instead of packing densities. So we don't use these terminologies like uh, VLSI or ULSI. We, we normally use the uh, nodes, technology nodes, or feature size. So this uh, feature size means the minimum feature we can implement using the lithography and uh, things like that. So this is one thing happened. So we have seen that uh, almost six decades, uh, the Moore's law stood for. So now the idea was you have a large workforce, then uh, more work at lesser cost and time. So then we have seen that the computation migrating because we have seen in the my second or third slide, you have seen that uh, vacuum tube based uh, computers. We have seen it used to occupy three-story building and consuming a lot of power and things like that. 
So it used to be uh, on a centrally air conditioned room and things like that. Then uh, it migrated to your desktop, palm top and whatnot, all wearables and all, everything because of the development in the microprocessors and memories, it was possible to do that. So it became almost like a godlike in the sense it became om all powerful and all ever present, omnipotent and omnipresent. And then it entered into all wax of uh, human life. The fundamental thing here was we have uh, a large workforce. You have like uh, that way because you have uh, uh, billion. See, basically we have seen your circuits are the, or the basic functionalities are developed by the circuits and circuits are developed by devices. If you have a large number of devices in your hand, you can develop different circuits and using different circuits, you can get more functionality. This is quite simple. So you have a large workforce. So there's a plenty of devices available. So starting with tens to thousands to so today as a, Raj Singh has said in the morning, we have billions of uh, transistors available currently on a, a single core of uh, silicon or the single substrate of silicon. So they have a large workforce available. Uh, this is the problem of plenty. So this uh, here I would, I'm going back to my title problem. Of, so you have large number of devices available. Technologically, it is possible to fabricate or to introduce or bring in large billions of transistors or millions of transistors on the single chip. So you needed uh, the managing this number. So then we have seen that increase the frequency, uh, the operating frequency could be increased in each generation of processors and increase the memory available. So coupled with, uh, and again, one important thing we need to keep it in mind was the batch processing was done. The, it is not that the chips are fabricated individually. You do it in batches, like uh, many of these universities do that. They uh, take more and more students, but the number of teachers and resources kept minimum. So, and take more number of students and get more fees. So the batches, number of batches will increase. So the cost, recurring cost will be reduced. So same thing happened in the microelectronics also because of the batch processing, the cost could be, the increase in cost is not considerable, whereas the performance was in increasing. So the, again, uh, beautifully explained by Dr. Chandrasekhar in the morning, the cost was coming down or the cost was not, uh, there was a, not much increase in the cost, whereas the performance in terms of speed and power consumption was improving. So that was happening in this, uh, microelectronics. So we have seen that, uh, see again, uh, this is uh, over the years from 92 to 2003, this is, uh, there was a feature size was reduced. Then the ga gates per chip was increasing from 0.3 billion millions to, to 20 millions. Then you have the uh, different types of memories, the gate number of gate count was increasing and uh, Cost, you can see that from 92 to 2003, the wafer processing cost, there was not much increase, rather it was a slight decrease only. Then the chip size was uh, increasing. Then you have the memory capacity and everything was, but one troubling thing that is uh, in the red line, you can see that uh, you have uh, the power consumption was this again, it was uh, discussed. So only thing is I'm uh, giving a graphical system, the quantifying it. So there are actually, you'll see that there are two types of device, uh, uh, ICs we talk of. One is HP high performance uh, chips, where the, we are uh, focused on the performance and there are like a uh, server class and uh, that kind of uh, computationally intensive devices are used. Other one is the portable devices, like your cell phone and uh, your tablet and where the performance is uh, not, the power consumption is the critical thing because battery operated. So you can see that there was the power consumption per watt per day 
was increasing over the years and it has reached uh, in the high H, uh, xp category of chips it increased almost uh, 200 watts or so even uh, even at a lower supply voltage so this was uh, a very uh, uh, critical issue so you, you had you, you came across a brick wall there so then again uh, this was again discussed so i am little giving a little elaboration here only that is the uh, uh, people start thinking in terms of uh, multi core processors so you can take advantage of the parallel processing so uh, instead of going for a single core processors you have uh, cores of processors so you can use uh, take advantage of uh, parallelism so so multiple uh, instructions on a separate course at the same time increasing overall speed for programs so of course uh, minimal to the parallel computing so you have uh, on a single die you have multiple cores I and mean, it could be uh, in the initial cases it was all identical uh, processes so instead of one co core of processor you have multiple cores so you, you have again in this case you have seen a quad processor four processors in and with each having independent uh, and uh, shared memories and uh, things like that. So otherwise, uh, it, because the single pro processors had uh, complexity of was there, then high leakage. And then of course, the main issue was the uh, heating. So you had uh, this uh, more, or you had tried to add more core. So this was one innovation which came up about, about this. But then, oh, is it uh, is it uh, advantages to use multi core processors so again we have to see that uh, when we the core processor you are looking at the par uh, uh, parallelism actually if applications of uh, where uh, parallelism is there is beneficial so but uh, if there is uh, the problem doesn't offer any parallelism then it won't be advantageous to use this multi core processes so so this is again we have seen that power supply even with the multi core the power supply cannot be reduced indefinitely due to threshold voltage limitations and all cores operating parallelly consume small power just uh, see ideally if I have 10 core or 64 core, I would like to, for the uh, highest efficiency, I would like to use all of them together. That is not possible because again, the power consumption will be quite large. So I cannot do, use, the, use them, all of them together. So only um, uh, partially it will be used. So that brings us to the era of, uh, uh, so this again, uh, there is, uh, this is uh, the parallelism issue is uh, beautifully explained by Amdahl's law. So when you have uh, multi-core processes, how effectively it can be used is divine, defined by the Amdahl's law. And uh, it depends upon the, uh, see, the a typical problem will have the serial part as well as the parallelism. The more it will be so, the ultimately the speed up will be decided by the uh, serial part. So that will be limiting. So it is the, Maximum speed up tends to be one by one minus p. So the total, the speed up is so we don't uh, gain much by that. So it depends on the problem. So it's uh, that is uh, Amla's law will come into play when we are using multi core processors. Second is one of the another uh, very important thing is the problem of dark silicon. Dark silicon implies that you have a lot of, it's like our uh, uh, green, after green revolution, we have produced a lot of grains and we have a lot of buffer stock, but we can't use them. So similarly, you have the Moore's law and other scaling principle enabled us to put billions of transistors into silicon, but you cannot use all of them together. So the dark silicon is a consequence of Amla's law and the power limitation. So we will be, we can use only a part of the silicon. If all of the silicon or the transistors in the chip 
cannot be used so that is known as the dark silicon where uh, most of the silicon will be remaining off uh, at, a, at a particular instant of time so it will only partially it will be used so that is why the problem of plenty we have a large number of devices available but all of them are not put into use together that is the kind of issue we have faced so this is uh, known as the uh, problem of dark silicon so it is decided by the number of transistors power consumption frequency and the supply voltage and the things like that so this is uh, the uh, each successive process generation the percentage of chip that can actively switch drops exponentially due to power constraints that that means each time we move to the next process generation more and more of the chip becomes dark silicon so they will be remaining idle so that is uh, dark silicon era so then the only thing is uh, you have uh, even though we went for the multi core processors uh, we have the performance increase uh, was not that significant so what we can do so we see we have the possibility of increasing more transistors but we need to know that we can't power them all of them at the same time so so we need to use those extra but the capable technologically you have capable of putting more transistors we have reached up to 3 nanometer feature size so more and more transistors can be put so how you have to find new ways of using this that was one was multi core then other one was many core I mean different kinds of you have a graphic processor so for example apple 10 or so you have uh, many core or doing different graphic processors are different the mathematical processors are different and things say like that so you can have many core many core means they are not identical multi core means identical multiple times the same core like dual core quad core i7 etc so you have identical cores many core means different kinds of cores and uh, domain specific means it is application specific for example when you have a graphic processor uh, you have a special kind of chip is used uh, if you have a text to speech converter speech converters you use a different dsp and the things like that. so this is a kind of heterogeneous uh, processing and uh, you have uh, you have to look towards the aggressive power management so this was uh, one thing so a uh, computing to be done in the most efficient place taking into consideration about the power as well as the, uh, the silicon space power was another constraint and uh, you have to look into the alternate ways of doing it so along with this or uh, what was happening is uh, there was a uh, uh, this silicon industry had uh, this road map so unlike many other industries so we have been uh, some 90s onwards you had this road map so where uh, all the industries together from europe us and uh, uh, this asian countries like uh, south korea japan uh, came together and they used to create the road map for next four years because, of, because guided by the moore's law so this uh, different aspects of the requirements were uh, uh, documented in this and then people could work on that the first generation was a national roadmap technology roadmap that was basically confined to us and then you had this international technology roadmap for semiconductors popularly known as itrs and uh, they concentrated on forecasting the rate of transistor scaling the technical impediments to be over which are to be overcome in the next coming years and how transistor density and performance affect the evolution of the integrated circuits so this was between uh, this uh, 98 to 2015 uh, this was a uh, kind of uh, documentation was done 
So this, uh, it was a group of uh, university industry and uh, other research in R&D labs uh, and the various aspects of microelectronics was taken care of. And so this was a guiding force for uh, most, for the, whether it is you are from academy, whether you are from industry or an R&D lab, this was a kind of guiding or a, uh, like it was a kind of uh, guide. So if you look into the, this, uh, uh, ITR uh, 98, as an example, if you look into the 98 ITRS program, it was from strategy to implementation. What are, what are strategies and what are the, uh, how we can implement so technology needs, possible solutions, then detail the suppliers. It's applicable for the original equipment manufacturer. That mean, OEM means the system developers. Or, uh, original equipment manufacturers, then chip manufacturers, and the things like that. So this uh, was strategy to implementation. All those things were documented in the roadmap. So now, the, like uh, the current currently, but looking beyond 2020. So this was happened in the 2015. They decided to abandon the ITRS and. Uh, and it was taken over by the IEEE. Uh, and that is, and the new name was given International Roadmap for Devices and Systems, that is known as IRDS. So earlier, it was from circuits to or the device to system level. So it was a bottom up approach. Now, with IEEE taking up and uh, the re Christian it as IRDS, the emphasis was placed on architectures and application. That means a top-down approach. So not from device to system level approach, that was thing. So first you look at the applications and then you look into the architectures, then you develop technology and devices according to that. So that was the top-down approach. Like in the design, we come very often come across top-down and bottom-up approach. Typically we are increasingly, we are going towards the top-down approach. Similarly in the uh, roadmap also, this approach was there uh, introduced and is uh, uh, so 2016 created by IEEE and uh, re christian as IRDS. So it is a successor to ITRS. So this is uh, intended is to provide a clear outline to simplify academic manufacturing and supply and research coordination regarding the development of electronic devices and systems. So the goal of the roadmap as far as IRDS is concerned is to identify key trends related to devices, systems, and all related technologies by generating a roadmap within, with a 15 year horizon. So you need to look into the generic devices and system challenges potential solutions and opportunities for innovation, all those things are looked into. And so, and you encourage related activities worldwide through collaborative events such as IEEE conferences, roadmap workshop. And I think this uh, workshop also is in that, will go in that direction. So again, we need to see that uh, in uh, like, uh, again, it was uh, mentioned. So uh, along with the more, what was happening is uh, we had uh, and more the, like MEMS things were coming. You have analog and passive elements. Then you have sensors, actu actuators were coming, biochips were coming. That was MEMS. Typically, more than more is uh, very often known as MEMS, where mechanical and electronic components are integrated into the same chip. Then more and more means uh, miniaturization was uh, going beyond uh, predicted by the more slow. So more more was happening. So all these uh, have things are happening. And then uh, we need to look into what is what is beyond CMOS. Like uh, uh, most of the time, uh, most uh, like uh, more slow was made possible, or the feature size reduction was made possible by most technology. So now we need to, we have reached a stage where we need to go beyond MOS also. So a new ecosystem for electronics industry is based on semiconductor technologies. 
because you have new requirement is coming deep learning data mining then you have artificial intelligence then uh, iot's and uh, many of these so application from, we have seen from the application point of view so all these aspects one need to keep it in mind so one key thing is the device architectures beyond 2020 what is like uh, this is something which i am something close to my heart because i am being a device simulator i mean like uh, my most of my time was spent in device simulation and device studies or de uh, teaching device physics so device architectures were like evolving over the period of time we have seen in 70s you have started with mos and aggressive scaling of mos was done then its channel material was changed the dielectric material was changed then a 22 nanometer node you have changed the structure like you have the finfet was introduced and now beyond 2020 it is proposed that uh, you may go for the gate all around devices uh, like uh, see finfet you have a uh, uh, gate in the three uh, uh, like it is a 3d device whereas in this case uh, gate will be surrounding the whole channel so that is a gate all around uh, kind of structures so that again it will be a mos basically but then the structurally it is much different from the traditional mos which you are familiar but the operating principle will be same you have a source drain and you have a channel and you apply a voltage across the gate and you induce a channel and then the conduction takes place between the source and the drain so that way it is similar but otherwise this the channel material is different the dielectric material is different different all so a lot of differences are there so but uh, the basic principle is same so gate all around gate all around mosfet could be introduced beyond 2020 so the again uh, when you look into the chip it's like uh, urban housing problem so you have uh, like uh, in a place like uh, delhi or faridabad you will see that uh, you cannot have on have a vertic, uh, horizontal space available even in ymca this was being uh, tried that uh, you go for the sky scrapers you go to the the only space available is towards the sky so you develop sky scrapers so the same philosophy people started thinking about the same philosophy in the chip manufacturing or chip, chip te uh, the ic technology also so that is uh, kind of thing so you have the traditional uh, 2d devices so somebody was asking about 2d and 3d structures so i have a uh, uh, 2.5d and then you have 3d typical vertical stacking so this is uh, these are the kind of i think from the figure it is quite clear so you have a side by side integration that is popularly known as the 2.5d on the vertical stacking uh, through wires is known as the 3d structures we have not stopped there so we are thinking of course currently it is uh, uh, 2.5d and the 3d is uh, coming but not that popular but the uh, chips available with that kind of structures but combining this 2.5 and 3 we are looking towards so this is the typical 3d so another view of uh, 2d 2.5d and 3d and then combining these two or uh, 2.5d and 3d you can have a 5.5d so it is looking like your uh, multi story flat true sky scrapers uh, sky scrapers in silicon so that is 5.5d so this has been this is an emerging thing so these are the kind of thing which is happening so we can we have seen that the scaling in the current decade and beyond is uh, 75 to 2002 it was the geometric of the planar scaling that you have this uh, equivalent scaling uh, we were introducing new materials new physical effects and the new vertical structures replace the planar transistors so you have the introduction at 22 nanometers we have seen 2011 or so they have introduced the finfet and up to 7 nanometers that is serving the purpose of uh, scaling and then you have the 3d power scaling 
and it is expected to go from uh, beyond 2022 2040 or so that is what irds this is from irds pro projection so this is uh, uh, the one way of uh, uh, short term that means up to 2025 to say 2030 to 40 one can go to with the gate all around structures and uh, things like that so the device architectures beyond 2020 will be looking like this kind of way with uh, it is basically based on mostly from the irds roadmap so now the important thing we need to understand is so far we were focusing only on numbers so this again i told you the title quantity and quality so we were so far we are thinking that uh, we have uh, more people put more people to work and get the work done that was the thing we were doing so the performance improvement was obtained using quantity not quality so you have a single device and any other put more devices and put uh, speed up parallel processing and uh, use batch processing to keep the cost down so now I'm, so now so far we, that way we were focusing and more slow and more slow was fo focusing on increasing the number of devices available to you per chip and uh, take advantage of bat batch processing and parallel processing so now so we were uh, happy with uh, more and uh, more the merrier and that uh, it is not uh, going to help us so you need to look into see us again uh, again i borrow from dr chandrasekhar's lecture so we had a uh, uh, computational device like a microprocessor and then memory you go on adding and the part fixed architectures were popularly known as newman's architectures were used so and then we were uh, playing with increasing the processing speed and things like that so we need to look at to alternate computation architectures and again we were uh, basically looking at the uh, binary uh, binary computation like by uh, using uh, zero ones and uh, kind of stuff only to binary variables and the things like that so we need to look beyond that so we need to look at the not on the quantity or quality like at the less number if we can get a better speed and a better performance why should i increase the number so blindly following more slow may not be necessary if you look to us alternate computational architecture because why i am taking computation because computational was computational or computation was the backbone of all it revolution that is why we are looking at the computation so we are going to hit and ultimately because there have always been a prediction of the death of most law but ultimately it is going to die so we need the, but the computational requirements are going in a big way you are thinking of machine learning you are thinking of artificial intelligence and the internet of things and things like that so we need to involve reimagining the digital computing starting with the new materials exploring new physics and new architectures and innovating new novel technologies with the new functionality that could be unprecedented computational efficiency. So that is one thing we can do and we need to look. So that is what beyond 2020, that is the requirement because already the applications are very much there. You have the machine learning things are like that. You need a, something to carry out efficiently the machine learning, artificial intelligence and the internet of things. Uh, and the application areas are already defined. So, so we need to look into these aspects. So what is to look beyond? So you have uh, this uh, solid state devices based on where one, one thing is you look at the CMOS and it, uh, more or less the CMOS has run its course. You can go the medium we can go to nano CMOS gate all around, then uh, send uh, like uh, uh, your carbon nano to field effect transistors and things like that. Then instead of uh, going the MOS route and the Moore's law, we can go to the quantum devices. That means devices based on the quantum principles like uh, 
quantum dots there are three variety of uh, quantum devices uh, one is the quantum wells quantum wires and the quantum dots all are based on the quantum principles then resonant tunneling devices are well, very super fast devices which can be used for uh, de designing computation devices and then single electron transistors that is the uh, these are uh, broadly the quantum devices then you can go to us the molecular devices again you will be using quantum principle there electromechanical systems and the biological systems and things like that so this is uh, alternate and uh, i think uh, some attempt will be made at least to simulate and uh, see the performance of some of these quantum devices and uh, nano cmos in the hands on session so you get you an idea about uh, uh, the uh, the kind of uh, performance they can give so that will be a good exercise so the tool which uh, amit is bringing probably will have that kind of capability so you get a feel of these devices uh, during the hands on session then you have uh, this uh, neuromorphic process neuromorphic means it is mimicking the brain actually the uh, brain has uh, one of the most efficient systems as far as power and uh, capabilities are concerned so it is a electronic analog systems to mimic neurobiological architectures so that is uh, another area ibm is doing some work in that then of course uh, much talked about quantum computers where uh, you are then you are not once you bring in uh, quantum computers i hope uh, there sometime in future you'll have a workshop on quantum computing where uh, details of all these quantum computers and its architectures and all those things are discussed so that will be very relevant so then uh, you are not slave of uh, your binary so you have uh, instead of that you have qubits so that will make it uh, like uh, much faster and you don't need that large number of billions of transistors are not necessary if you go for that then of course the analog computers may also uh, come back uh, in a big way then the application area the medical devices again uh, medical diagnostics if they especially with the covid thing this has become very important in the uh, like uh, in, then the this again the application area the automobiles more, more or less you have a lot of uh, applications and then of course the driverless cars and the things like that so in the research areas you need to look into this uh, uh, mainly from the device point of view novel materials and processing techniques then uh, especially graphene cnd and other compound semiconductors and the uh, devices based on them will be of uh, interest so the educational officer uh, because uh, starting point will be the uh, get the resources available so then you have this uh, edu uh, this educational needs like human resource generation and creation of engineers so you have the language skills like uh, python then move from from hdl you uh, like very log to you have to move to a system c because hdl doesn't have the Verilog doesn't have the most popular HDL is Verilog. That is why I'm taking Verilog. Verilog doesn't have system level capabilities because system means you have uh, your heterogeneous integration. You have mechanical systems and other sensors, etc., are there. So you need to go beyond the simple hardware description language. So that is uh, system C becomes very important. So you need to again edu uh, educate your uh, teachers and students on this. Then you need to educate the from the application point of view artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning i understand that there is some codes running on artificial intelligence and machine learning and this is uh, very relevant from the industry point of view so you need to be educating students on this then of course uh, third dft see uh, as engineers you have been always familiar with first dft discrete fourier transform then you have the other one is uh, designed for test by microelectronics people are familiar with the second dft that is uh, designed for testability so the design stage itself you worry about the 
uh, testing and so in, incorporate suitable hardware part for the this, uh, testing. So D, that is DFT. The third one is, uh, that is more of physics based, that is density functional theory. So this is our uh, density functional theory or DFT is capable of uh, doing many of the chemistries. Uh, you can do, uh, do the modeling of biological systems. You can do using DFT, you can use uh, material studies, material modeling and uh, study, a study of novel materials and their band gap and other things can be studied. Or using DFT, that is density functional theory. So you need to be educating students in these areas. So then you can go for the computer synthesized drugs. Then uh, modeling of biological systems is increasingly becoming very important. So we can do it because biology is more about chemistry and chemistry can be done using DFT. So it can be done. So modeling of Biological systems are possible. Then of course, uh, you can do the material modeling, study of novel materials and their properties can be studied because that is a starting point. Then you can develop uh, devices based on and once you have the devices, you can think of uh, their applications and uh, things like that. So you can develop new materials and new devices using these two. So TCAD tools helps us in doing this. So educating us with the TCAD tools is very important. In this. So these are the educational needs. So I think uh, it is the uh, time to stop my blabbering. So thank you for your uh, patience. So I will be happy to take up a few questions, if any. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, now we can have questions from participants in anyone. We can have question answers uh, in the chat box also. We can take over the same for you. Or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, starting from definition of engineering to how uh, IoT AI has become the prompt engineering words. It was a wonderful session. So any uh, thing which you want to have take away must from your session for all the students? So actually, I one of the important thing is device physics is given least device and uh, materials are given least importance by the earlier in engineering education, especially. So that has to go. It's understand good understanding of materials. And I think the syllabus also take uh, need to uh, frame it or reframe it like that. So that uh, good understanding, especially the semiconductor materials, good understanding of semiconductor materials and devices are very important in developing systems, actually. Because earlier, uh, it was kind of a black box kind of approach that was OK. But currently, that is uh, not. And because you cannot do justice without understanding uh, the materials and the devices. So proper understanding of device physics is very important. So in the course of uh, this TCAT tools or hands-on workshop, that should be because without uh, knowing those things, you cannot do, the, you cannot use the TCAT tools, unfortunately. Exactly, so sir, exactly. That understanding is necessary. So don't uh, see, otherwise it will be a simply a garbage in and garbage out. You can simulate devices, you can get the devices and characteristics, but that will be useless exercise, actually, because you'll be doing without uh, understanding, because modeling models are developed based on the properties of the material and the device char characteristics, etc. So that understanding is very important. So that should be given emphasis. The students should be able to understand the importance of that. Yeah. And students can do that, sir. There are a lot many MOOC courses. When they select their MOOC courses and want to pursue this field in particular, they can have this kind of channel uh, channelization yeah. of the subjects they are selecting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I recommend uh, some of these courses run by Coursera and um, uh, this EDX. 
they are there are device phys, uh, top experts from mit stanford etc giving courses on device physics and uh, i myself has attended some of those courses and it's, uh, they are beautiful especially more a good understanding of mos physics and mos devices is very important and then use of these tools then they can use these tools there are many open open source tools are also available they can use those of course you are also you have some ticket tools available they can use it the license uh, tools can be also is there and you can use that or if they want then the nano hub provides online uh, tools so there uh, they can study about these materials and devices so and uh, there are a lot of presentation materials also available so that becomes very important for the future microelectronics engineers yeah so these are new courses are very good and because they can do it uh, their own pace actually yeah and a small amount of money is required because they, they are not free if you want like to for our university students our universities enroll into it na so it's free mm. so we do look forward to if they want to pursue this particular uh, field in as a career they need yeah. to select the course in a similar yeah. fashion mm. so device physics is a must if they want to go for tcat simulation to understand mm. how no, not only for uh, pursuing even for an engineer increasingly if you want to otherwise you will be constrained so good understanding of device physics or materials uh you cannot have a good micro as far as microelectronics is concerned you are limited then actually there will be limitation there is other like traditional engineering and communication see for example if you are just going to towards the pure communication side then it may not be because but you are developing a communication chip then you need to Then, any other question? Anyone uh, with any question? Thank you so much, Prasad sir. It's always a great learning whenever we hear from you, and especially for me, every talk of yours is a big uh, uh, sack of knowledge, sir. every point a point of yours is something which leads to the next step how we need to proceed further and definitely we'll again get back to you and we do look forward to more such kind of sessions from your end sir mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you yeah. so much sir yeah yeah bye then. thank you thank you sir we can have 10 minutes break from now before we start with the next session next session will be taken by mr amit saini who will be